Psalms 126. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Bible says, When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. Then said they among the nations, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who goeth continually forth weeping, bearing seeds for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Honor thy word, my Father, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The theme today is the life is here. The key words in this passage are tears and weeping. These words are never more freshly on my mind than when I first asked Christ into my life as Lord and Savior. It seemed that I'd experienced the same emotion as the Jews in Psalm 126. It's referred to as a psalm of descent. You may say, why a psalm of descent? The children of Israel had been in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. God had miraculously, I mean momentarily, supernaturally released them from Babylonian captivity. When he released them, they made their way out of the south back to the city of Zion, the land of God, to the city, the holy city of Jerusalem. Psalm 126 would have been sung to the Lord as they made their way back to Israel. Listen to the words they would have sung. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. Then said they among the nations or the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Songs have been written about this psalm. The psalms was the Jewish hymn book. They were singing it to the Lord. Someone said that the Bible is our hymn book. It's all about him. And it is from Genesis to Revelations. All 66 books are about God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his plan of redemption paying the price for our sins. He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. When I read this psalm 32 years ago, I remember thinking to myself, this psalm seems to also be a spiritual typology. What God did for the Israelites, God does for every person who comes to Christ. And so I begin to look at the elements of Surprise, the elements of gladness that God had placed in the heart of the Israelites. And I begin to think he does the same thing in the life of someone who is converted to him. Uh, when these Israelites were released from captivity, I'm going to show you in a moment that the Bible records in history in Jeremiah 24 through Jeremiah 29 that God released them a remnant of, at a time which means they did not, did not all experience the release at the same time. But here's one thing that I know. When someone has been held captive and they've been set free, once they begin to enjoy their freedom, they wish to God that everyone they knew could experience freedom. For instance, when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, as a 20-year-old young man back in 1973, with that being said, Christ changed my life. Not long after I became a Christian, I began to think, I want everybody to become a Christian. I want mom and dad to know Christ. I want Freddie, Mary, Barbara, Norman, Buddy. I want my whole family to know Christ. I want Donald, Rex, Aberdeen. I mean, the list went on and on. I want my friends to know Christ. I wanted the ones who managed to pull hall that I managed to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I just began to share that burden. Well, in this text, the same thing follows suit. You want people. Matter of fact, I'm concerned about the church today. 
in the context that people claim to know Christ, they come into God's family and they forget those that have still not been set free. The Bible says that if you come to know freedom and you see others in danger, he said, blow a trumpet to warn them of impending judgment so they may also escape the wrath to come. He said, if you blow the trumpet and they listen to you, you have saved a soul. Wait now, stay with me. But if you do not give them warning, their blood, are y'all watching, will be upon our hands. And so there's a lot of people are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ one day and the blood of lost souls will be upon your hands because we never took it upon ourselves to obey Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. So in this passage, this person takes to heart the blessing of being saved. So with that being said, let me just make a few observations about this sermon. Let me talk to you first of all in verses 1 and 2 in the text about the blessing of being saved experienced. The Apostle Paul, when he gave us the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he didn't give it to us, Jesus did, but when he was giving it to the church at Corinth, when he gave us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4, he made statements like this, I declare unto you that which I first received myself. How many of you know that you can't declare what you haven't received? It's been said that you can teach what you know, but you can only reproduce who you are. And so in this text, the psalmist has received of God. Now he stands to declare. And so he tells them that he has experienced a release that has been anything but commonplace listen to what he says he says when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion or the King James says when the Lord turned again to captive Zion we were like those that dream why would he refer to something so wonderful as being set free as a dream because if you were in bondage for 70 years and undoubtedly hope could have been gone I mean how long can you hold on hoping that one day you'll be free and then finally when you are free it seems too good to be true so you say it seems as though it were a dream would you not agree listen carefully to this story if the Bible is true and I believe with all of my heart and bet my life that it is and many have died 11 of the 12 disciples died because they knew the gospel was true. They saw Christ, touched him, fellowship with him, watched him die, and saw him after he was alive. They believe it was real. And so what do you mean it was a real salvation? It means that there was a time in your life when you knew that you were a sinner and your sins separated you from knowing God. That the Bible teaches that no one is good enough to go to heaven in their own goodness. That's what the cross is all about. Jesus Christ, when the wrath of God was poured out from heaven against him on the cross, he was receiving the just punishment that I deserved. The wrath that he received was intended for me. The African-American many years ago that penned that old song, were you there when they crucified the Lord? That was a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious if you'll ponder it. You were not there 2,000 years ago, literally in the sense that you were there physically. You weren't alive then. But the sins that you would commit that would need atonement, somebody to pay a debt, a price for those sins, you were there. I was there. And any, anyone that will ever live in Adam's race was there. And yet Christ paid that penalty so we could be saved. And then there comes a time in your life, a time when you ask Christ to forgive you, to step out of heaven, to step into your heart, where he comes and brings his nature into your life, he brings his provisions into your life, he forgives you, he gives you a clean slate. He used the terminology in John chapter 3, you're born again. Life starts afresh and anew because of what Christ did on the cross. If God can do that, and that means that you could actually go to church, listen carefully to this, and I'm being just as candid as I possibly can be. 
that on the way to church, had you died in a car accident, you would have gone to hell because you were separated from God and it was your sins that separated you. But you went to church and you heard the gospel and the gospel being that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that on the third day, hell could not hold him, death could not hold him, the grave could not hold him. He rose victorious from the grave and he's alive today. And now I've come to receive him as my personal Lord and Savior and now my life's changed. That would be like going home saying, an hour ago I was on my way to hell and now I'm totally forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. To say that is almost like a dream, but it's real. It is so real that a songwriter came a few years later and wrote these words. Listen to this old song. Oh, how well do I remember how I doubted day by day. Have you ever doubted whether you'd go to heaven when you die? For I did not know for certain that my sins were washed away. When the Spirit tried to tell me, I would not the truth receive. I endeavored to be happy and to make myself believe. So I prayed to God in earnest and not caring what folks said. I was hungry for the blessing. My poor soul, it must be fed. When at last by faith I touched him and like sparks from smitten steel, just so quick salvation reached me. <laughs> oh, bless God. I know it's real. The Course says, it's real, it's real. Oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled. I know, I know it's real. I wonder how many hundreds in this room, thousands watching by internet around the world have never settled the doubts. And what you would give to be able to say, it's real, it's real. Oh, praise God, I know it's real. All the doubts have been settled, and I know it's real. I didn't go to church as a child. None of us did. I didn't own a Bible. Dad checked out when I was seven. I've got a sister and brother over there that can check this off. Confirm, confirm, confirm. And uh, we lived in a project in Wilmington, North Carolina. No church as a kid. And so then at the age of 18, Janet had been 17, 17 days. Uh, we fell in love. And uh, someone may say, can you do that yet young? Well, 38 years later, I think you can. And the bottom line is, uh, we got married. Was the marriage on the rocks, uh, to say the least? And then her grandmother started inviting us to church, so periodically we'd go down to Myrtle Grove Presbyterian. What, what do you mean by periodic? Christmas Eve, Easter. And then I had a carpenter named N.W. Pridgen. He's, he's with the Lord now. His wife Edna's with the Lord. And he would always say, Johnny, I wish you'd go to church with me, and he was persistent. So Janet and I went to Longleaf Baptist Church and I'd not been one to go to church. I had a suit that I'd bought to go to a party, the only one I'd ever owned. We sat near the back, didn't own a Bible, listened to the message. My wife said, that's good, let's start visiting around. I, I didn't know what it meant by visiting around. Now that I'm a pastor, I know what visiting around means. And I said, and I was a very timid and shy person back then. And so I remember saying, no, I don't want to go anywhere else. And the reason is I was too shy to go anywhere else. I said, if we're going to go, we're going to go back here. We went for probably four Sunday mornings. I didn't know the terminologies to use then, but during the preaching, I would listen, but I'm not so sure that I was moved that much, but God was using it. But when they would say, we're going to stand in a moment, as we're going to do in a moment, and we're going to sing an invitation hymn, I couldn't explain this, but when we would start to sing songs like, Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And I would sit there and would get emotional. Now, I was in the pool room. My daddy used to whip us, and if he said, if you don't quit crying, I'm going to whip you harder. I would learned to take pain without tears. And so now here I am hanging out at the pool room, thinking I'm a tough guy. What in the world am I doing crying? Felt like other people in the sanctuary were probably watching me with tears, and I thought it made me feel like less than a man. Little did I know, people all around me, they were not watching me making fun of me. They were watching me and praying for me. And so I sat there, and then the preacher did something at the close of the service. The preacher said the service, the church was running about 300 people, and the pastor said, there's a young man here, and it is obvious that he's under conviction. Let's pray 
as a church before we dismiss that God would compel that young man to come back tonight and give his life to Jesus Christ. I was that young man. By the way, you may say, how, how do you know? Uh, someone said, oh, God had your number. No, God doesn't have your number. Ladies and gentlemen, God knows your name. And so instead of racing my car that afternoon at Holly Ridge Drag Strip, I shocked my wife and I said, I want us to go back to church tonight. And so I went to church that night, and where we normally sit in the back, I sat down near the front, Richard, probably close to where you're sitting. And the reason I sat there is because I came to church for one purpose, to meet God. I wanted to meet God. And here's what I said, Janet. I can't change my life. If Jesus Christ can, he's welcome to it. But if he doesn't, don't give me a hard time if I want to go back to the Red Fox Saloon tomorrow night. I knew that I needed life change, that turning over a leaf on January the 1st could not change your life. And so I went to church, and, and let me tell you what happened. I went in order to say when the invitation is given, I'm going forward and I'm going to give my life publicly, unashamedly to Jesus Christ. But as the service went on, I got nervous. I got to thinking, I don't know if I can do this. So I started backing out. We call it crawl fishing. I started crawl fishing. And then I looked over. I came up with an ingenious idea. I said, Janet, when the invitation's given, go forward and tell Mr. Gibson, I want to be saved. <laughs> I was trying to get Janet to make the decision for me. How many of you know that no one can make the decision for you? No one. And so after a few minutes, I, I got up the nerve, and, and I went down. And I really do remember, it's indelibly written in my heart and mind, and I've told the story for so many years that I'll never forget what I said. I said, Mr. Gibson, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus Christ. He asked me some questions. He said, Johnny, do you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? I said, yes, sir, I do. Matter of fact, when I had a bottle of liquor in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and taking God's name in vain on my lips and trying to win somebody's money on the pool table. If you'd have asked me at the pool room, do you believe Christ died on the cross? I'd have said yes. So you need to know that hell will be full of people that believe stuff about the gospel that never had a personal encounter with the Jesus who died on the cross and gave us the gospel. Please know that. It's not what you know that will keep you out of hell. It's not what you know that will take you to heaven. It's what you do with what you know about God's Son that will keep you out of hell and take you to heaven. See, you can miss heaven. You can miss heaven by 14 inches. You can know everything about God in your head and never have received God's Son, Christ, salvation in your heart. And so that night, I, I talked with the pastor and I made my commitment to Jesus Christ. They said to me, now, Johnny, now that you've been saved, you need to identify with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection by confessing your faith publicly, and you do that in baptism. I said, fine. I mean, I didn't argue, no pushback, because Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, do not what I say? Jesus said of religious leaders that had lips that testified but hearts that were far from him, he said this. He said, they say and they do not. I don't want it on my record that I'm a Christian. Professing Christian is always saying but not doing. So when they said you need to be baptized, Janet and I were baptized together the next Sunday night at Longleaf Baptist Church. Pastor Johnny, what happened that night? Jesus Christ changed my want-tos. How about the Red Fox Saloon? I can't explain it, but God changed my want-tos. Listen to me carefully. When Jesus Christ comes to live inside of you, Jesus Christ changes your want-tos. He literally changes your life. Any man in Christ is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. God forbid that my wife would ever be overheard saying I live with Johnny and I'm not sure he's a Christian but as a minister of the gospel I've heard that thousands of times I've heard wives say I question whether my husband's saved I've heard husbands say I question whether my wife's saved I've heard many parents say I don't know if my kids know the Lord if the way they live is any evidence that they really know Jesus there's a good chance they've never met him Listen to this text. This is a very strong text. Verse 2. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the nations, and the Greek word there says the heathen, those who do, do not acknowledge God as their own personal Lord. They said, the Lord's done great things for them. Now, do you understand what that text says? That's one of the most powerful confirmations in the world. People that don't know God looked at people that had come to know God and said they are 
really different. You know what the missing element in the church of Jesus Christ is in the 21st century? Those of us that know him don't look enough different from those that don't in order to allow those that don't to be able to acknowledge that those that do really do. Don't ask me to say that again. But did you catch that? Did you catch what I just said? That those that don't know Christ would be able to say, now that's a Christian, if I've ever seen one. So the Bible says the heathen even said. So here's what you need to know this morning. You need to know not only that you have a real relationship with God, but you need to know that it is a recognizable relationship with God. That even the unconverted can say, that's an interesting story. You have really shown major life change. And let me ask you a question. If you're a Christian and nobody notices it and you never feel impressed to talk about it, can I ask one question in one word? Why? I've had people talking to me all week, Chip, about the weather. People, I'm sure they never talked to you, Senator, about politics. Governor, nobody wants to talk politics, would you do? I mean, what you think about what's going on in the White House? Would you not agree that we all talk about what's important to us? One day when you draw your last breath, how much money you have won't matter. How many children you have won't matter. Where you work won't matter. How many hours you work. How many degrees you hold. What offices you serve. How many people I preach to won't matter. What will matter is how many are going with me to heaven. Hey, can I give you a one-liner that you can take home with you? Here it is. Eternity is far, far too long to be wrong. Uh, can you think of anything that would be more disheartening, more of a tragedy, than for somebody to go to hell and in hell say, what in the world am I doing here? What, where did I miss it? And then they would have to think, I, I thought I was getting here because of my good works. Didn't my infant baptism seal this? Absolutely not. Absolutely ba infant baptism is not even a biblical deal. It's a tradition brought to us out of a religious system. You're baptized after you become a believer. That's when you identify with Christ. It's your decision. Your mom and dad can't make your decision. You laughed a moment ago when I told you that I asked Janet to go make my decision. Why do you laugh at Janet making a 20-year-old's decision if you think a child is sealed because a mom and dad made their decision? Come on, give me a break. Let's play with the same cards. The only thing that gives you the assurance that you're going to heaven is where the Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is not a good way. He's not even the best way. He's the only way to God based on the Bible, the Word of God. Do you know him? Has all the doubts been settled? Can you say, I'll tell you one thing, Pastor Johnny, the relationship I know with Jesus Christ is a real relationship. Did you know you can be saved where you sit? There in the balcony, downstairs, in front of a computer screen. You, you can be saved right there where you are by opening your heart and asking Christ to come in. If you feel the tug at your heart, it's not the pastor getting to you because I don't have the power to do that. Human persuasion never changed the life. It's the exposing power of Christ making your need real and what he did for you available. And so would you right now where you sit say, I'm ready to make a, a genuine real commitment, a real life change commitment to Jesus Christ this morning so that when I draw my last breath, I will know heaven is a real place for me to go. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If this prayer... It's really the way you're feeling inside, in your heart, in your soul. Why don't you make it your own and pray it to God and ask Christ 
to change your life this morning. As I pray out loud, you pray this prayer in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, just tell him, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I admit that I cannot save myself or change my own life. I need you. Thank you that you died on the cross so I could be forgiven. With that in mind, would you please forgive me this morning? Would you save me? Would you come into my life and change me forever, for all eternity? I'm sorry for my sins. Have mercy on me. And Lord Jesus, thank you this morning for hearing my prayer and for saving me. Now help me to never be ashamed of knowing you. And may I live the rest of my life for Jesus.